Hello, hello. Good day to everyone. Sir Howard here. Pag-uusapan natin ngayon, itutuloy natin yung ating discussion on psychometric property. Again, in the past videos, we discussed that psychometric property, very important for psychological tests to have para maging functional or magandang gamitin ang isang psychological test. And in the past videos, napag-usapan na natin yung psychometric property of reliability For today, we leave that topic, pupunta na tayo ngayon sa validity of psychological test. As you will see, habang nagpapatuloy ako sa aking lecture, reliability and validity are two different things. Although they are different, pareho naman silang nagpapaganda sa isang psychological test. Now, the topic of validity is very long. Marami kasing procedures of validity compared to reliability. The following are the six skills I want you to develop as you watch these next videos. Number one, define and explain the concept of validity. Number two, differentiate validity from reliability. Mahalaga yan. Number three, differentiate the categories of validity procedures from each other. Number four, identify the appropriate situations when to use the different categories of validity procedures. That's also very important. Hindi yung gamit ka lang ng gamit ng, ng procedure under validity. You should know tuwing kailan mo gagamitin. Number five, enumerate specific validity methods under each major validity categories. And number six, recite the step-by-step -step procedures to be taken in executing each of the validity methods. Dapat in your mind alam mo kung ano yung mga steps na gagawin para makapag-execute ka ng isang validity procedure. So I hope at the end of this series of videos under validity, mahit nyo yung anim na skill set na yan. Let's define validity. Paulit-ulit na to sa undergrad pa lang. It is the ability of a psychological test to measure what it claims to measure. If a test can measure what it is designed to measure, then we say that test is valid. Sa Tagalog, ang ibig sabihin lang yan, ang tanong dyan sa validity, Ginagawa ba ng test ang dapat niyang ginagawa? Let me use an analogy para i-describe sa inyo ano bang ibig sabihin ng validity. Halimbawa, may measure natin yung validity ng isang cough syrup. Imagine that a psychological test is a cough syrup. Ano ba ang purpose? Ano ba ang dahilan bakit nag-develop ng isang cough syrup para magamot ang ubo to treat cough? Therefore, what is a valid cough syrup? It is a cough syrup that can treat cough. Ginawa ang cough syrup para gumamot ng ubo. Therefore, nagiging valid ang cough syrup kapag nakakagamot nga siya ng ubo. So halimbawa, tinest natin yung validity ng cough syrup at ang lumabas, ganito. Merong isang tao, may ubo at sipon, uminom ng cough syrup na dinevelop natin na wala ang sipon. This cough syrup is not valid kasi it is supposed to treat cough, hindi yung sipon. Eh, yun nga ang problema eh. Uminom siya ng cough syrup, meron siyang ubo at sipon, ang nawala ay yung sipon. Yung ginamot niya, yung sipon at hindi yung ubo, then that cough syrup is not valid. O, binigay mo naman sa taong may sipon, yung cough syrup. Gumaling yung sipon niya. Is it a valid cough syrup? Hindi rin. Kasi nga, cough syrup must treat cough. Hindi dapat niya tinitreat ang sipon. Ang tao merong ubo at sipon. Uminom nung dinevelop natin cup syrup na wala ang ubo pero may sipon pa rin. Is that a valid cup syrup? It is a valid cup syrup. Kasi ginawa siya para mawala ang ubo, yun ang nangyari. Nawala yung ubo. Pero sir, hindi nawala yung sipon. Okay lang yun. Kasi hindi naman talaga dinesign yung cup syrup na ito para gumamot ng sipon. May isang tao, may ubo. Uminom ng dinevelop natin cup syrup na wala ang ubo, then definitely this cup syrup is valid. So I hope based on this analogy, you can now clearly understand what we are doing in doing validity of psychological tests. I-apply mo lang yung principle na yon in psychological tests, it looks something like this. What is a valid happiness scale? Paano mo masasabi ng isang happiness scale is a valid happiness scale? Kapag napatunayan natin that this test indeed measures happiness. Ganon din naman sa IQ. Paano mo masasabi na yung IQ test eh valid? 
eh kapag napatunayan mo na yung test na ito ay nagme-measure nga ng katalinuhan. So that's what you mean by validity. We are checking the ability of the test if it can measure what it is supposed to measure. Again, huwag kayong malilito. Iba ang reliability sa validity. They ask different questions about a psychological test. Reliability is the issue of consistency. Meron bang kakayanan yung test ko na magbigay sa akin ng consistent results? While validity is asking about the ability of the test to fulfill its purpose. Is my test fulfilling its purpose? Is my test measuring the thing that it is supposed to measure? Reliability and validity are two different things. Now, in most textbooks, kapag babasa ka ng chapter on validity, usually, dito lang sila nag-highlight the ability of the test to measure what it claims to measure. But this is something very important. Alam nyo ba, ang validity, meron pa siyang ibang expressions. Like for example, if your test has the ability to predict future thinking and behavior, isa siyang expression ng validity. Alam nyo ba, kapag yung test na ito, if the psychological test has the ability to make test takers take the test seriously, that is also the expression of validity. So, ang sinasabi ko lang dito on this slide is, validity can be expressed in three different ways. To measure what it claims to measure, to predict thinking and behavior, or to make test takers take tests seriously. All of these bullets na minention ko are expressions of validity. In fact, Dito na ngayon papasok yung three different categories of validating procedures. Maraming klase, maraming paraan ng validating a psychological test, but you can group them according to three categories. Meron tayong tinatawag na construct identification procedures, meron tayong criterion prediction procedures, meron din tayong content description procedures. Under each procedure, mapapansin ninyo, meron siyang mga specific way on establishing the validity of the test. Kaya nga sabi ko, mas maraming procedures meron sa validity compared to reliability. Now, very common question that students ask when they see these validating procedures, ano ang pipiliin mong procedure in establishing the validity of a psychological test? Halimbawa, nag-develop ka ng sarili mong psychological test and you would like to prove to the market that your test is valid, ano ang pipiliin mo? Ang sagot dyan, depende. Depende kung anong klaseng validity ang gusto mong patunayan na meron ang test mo. If, for example, you want to prove that your test can measure what it claims to measure, ibang mga procedures ang gagamitin mo dyan. If you want to, to, to prove that your test has the ability to predict thinking and behavior, iba na namang procedure ang gagamitin mo. If you want to know if your test has the ability to make test takers take it seriously, iba na namang procedures yung gagamitin mo, you just refer to this, again, table. Okay? So, kung gusto mo, again, going back to number one, to measure what it claims to measure, punta ka dyan. Age differentiation, convergent validity, discriminant validity, factor analysis, contrasted groups, pili ka ng isa dyan. Kung gusto mo yung number two, you want to prove, that your test can do that, bullet number 2, pili ka ng isa dyan. Kung gusto mo naman yung bullet number 3, punta ka naman doon sa number 3. That is how you determine kung anong procedure, validity procedure yung gagamitin mo if you want to establish the validity of your psychological test. Okay, so yun yung differences in the categories of validating procedures. It depends on what kind of validity would you like to show your test can do. Bago natin pag-usapan yung specific procedures in establishing test validity, mahalaga na huwag yung kakalimutan yung correlation. Because correlation is the statistical technique that we use para maintindihan how tests are validated. Let's review. In correlation, we try to relate, we try to measure how strong the relationship is between variable A and variable B. So, i-quantify mo yung variable A by using an instrument. I-quantify mo yung variable B using an instrument. You administer those tests in a population. Kukunin mo yung mga raw scores ng population na yon, And then you are going to correlate 
those two variables. Sa ending, you are going to do a, or you are going to get a correlation coefficient. This is now the measure of how strong the relationship is between variable A and variable B. So, kung maaalala ninyo, reviewin lang natin ng mabilis, correlation coefficient has two parts, direction and magnitude or strength. Direction, pwedeng positive or negative. Pag positive, ibig sabihin direct relationship. As variable A goes up, variable B goes up. As variable A goes down, variable B goes down. Kapag negative naman, ibig sabihin inverse ang relationship. As A goes up, B goes down. As A goes down, B goes up. Yung decimal number naman sa kanan nung sign is what we call the magnitude or the strength. Dito na natin binabase if the relationship is strong, moderate, or weak. What is a strong relationship from 0.80 approaching 1? Moderate relationship is at around 0.60 until point, uh, 0.50 until 0.69. Weak relationship, 0.49 and below. Different textbooks, different statisticians will may have different ranges kung ano ang strong, moderate, or weak. But generally, yung sinabi ko, yun yung range ng magnitude for you to say if it is strong, moderate, or weak. So halimbawa, nag-correlate ka ng dalawang variables, religiosity and self-confidence, lumabas that there is a direct and strong relationship between religiosity and self-confidence. What does that mean? It seems like ang mga taong religyoso, mataas, ay mga self-confident din. And vice versa, yung mga taong hindi masyadong religyoso ay hindi rin ganun ka-self-confident. Kapag naging negative naman yung relationship pero strong pa rin, mag na naman yung interpretation mo dyan. Those people who are highly religious, pala simba, pala dasal, mukhang hindi sila ganun ka-confident and vice versa, yung mga taong hindi ganun ka-religious, sila naman yung mga taong matataas ang level of confidence because the relationship is inverse. Okay, so wag yung kakalimutan yung kung papaano bumasa at mag-interpret ng correlation coefficient. Now, let's move on discussing Number one, that the first the first category of validity procedures, construct identification procedures. Under this category, meron tayong limang methods, age differentiation, convergent, discriminant validity, factor analysis, and contrasted groups. Huwag natin kalilimutan ano ang tanong na gusto mong sagutin, kaya kagagamit ng isa sa mga procedures na ito is the test measuring what it claims to measure. If this is your question about your psychological test, then you choose any one of these five to validate your test. Pero bago natin pag-usapan yung mga specific methods na yun, no? very important that you first understand the meaning of the word construct. Remember, going back to that slide, ang tawag daw sa mga procedures na ito ay construct identification procedures. These procedures... Anong ginagawa? nag identify Ano raw yung ina-identify ng mga procedures na yan? Yung tinatawag nating construct. You pronounce this as construct, okay? Not construct. Construct kasi verb yun, no? We are using this as a noun. Construct identification procedures. Anong ibig sabihin ng construct? Simple lang, ito yung variable na pinaka-minimeasure ng psychological test. So kung ano man ang minimeasure ng isang psychological test, then that is the construct of the test. And usually, malalaman mo na naman kung ano ang construct sa isang psychological test based on the title of the psychological test. For example, Stanford Binet Intelligence Test or Raven's Progressive Matrices, if you study the title of the test or even the nature of the test, malalaman mo na, maaamoy mo na, na ang minimeasure dyan ay intelligence. So in this case, the tests, Stanford Binet and Raven's Progressive Matrices, ang kanilang construct is intelligence. Ganon din naman pag personality. Ano yung mga test out there na ang construct niya, na ang sinusukat niya ay personality? One example, NeoPyR. Ang NeoPyR ay isang psychological test that aims to measure your personality into five components, the ocean. Pero ano ang construct ng Neo Pi R, ano ang kanyang sinusukat ang sagot personality. That's what you mean by the word construct. 
Now, let's discuss the different ways to check kung yung test mo ba, meron nga siyang ganong construct na minimeasure. Minimeasure nga ba ng isang test ang construct na kiniklaim niyang minimeasure niya? How do we know that? Let's discuss. Okay? Let's start with case number one. Ready? You just read this on your own silently. If you need to pause the video, go ahead. So we are here to validate if this test is indeed measuring intelligence. Paano natin masisigurado na yung dinevelop natin o yung test na pinag-uusapan sa case number one is really measuring intelligence? Steps. Step one. Kunin mo yung test na yan, i-administer mo yan to different grade levels. Administer mo yung test sa mga grade 1, yung, mga te yung test sa grade 2, yung test sa grade 3. So, three different populations, one psychological test that measures intelligence. Why are we doing that? Bakit mo ina-administer sa grade 1, grade 2, grade 3? Para mahuli natin, makita natin kung mag iba iba ba yung mga resulta ng mga tao sa grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3. Kasi yun yun nabasa mo sa literature, no? According to your reading of Revlit, before you constructed the test, one quality of intelligence is that it increases as one advances in age. So based on this, what you have read on the literature, yung logic niyan will explain this. Kaya mo siya i-administer sa grades 1, 2, and 3 para makita mo if they will differ in their scores because intelligence increases as one ages. Step 2. Kapag na-administer mo na yung test na yan sa grade 1 population, grade 2 population, grade 3 population, now, the exciting part, you want to see the results. Computein mo na yung raw scores ng bawat estudyante and then tignan mo ngayon yung pattern of results. Among grade 1 population, grade 2 population, and grade 3 population. Ano dapat ang itsura ng result? If your test is indeed really measuring intelligence, something like this. Kapag nakita mo na yung pattern of results mo, eh ganyan, pinakamatalino ang grade 3, susunod ang grade 2, pinakamababa ang katalinuhan grade 1, intelligence, sabi sa literature, grows with age, and that's what you saw in your data, then we can say that this test is valid. Kapag yung intelligence test na dinevelop mo hindi valid, Ibig sabihin, hindi yan susunod sa expected results mo based on the literature. Sabi sa literature, as one ages, intelligence increases. So kapag ganito ang result na nakuha mo, mukhang hindi siya tugma sa sinasabi ng literature, which means your test may be measuring something else but definitely not intelligence. Eh sir, ano kaya yung something else na yun? na measure nung intelligence test na dinevelop ko, hindi ko alam. But what we know is, definitely your test is not measuring intelligence because it is not following or it does not fulfill what is being described in the review of literature. Now, the procedure that we use is called age differentiation technique. In this technique, we try to find out the validity of the test by using different groups according to age. Gusto natin i-check kung yung construct ba na minimeasure ng test na ito nag-iiba-iba depende sa age group kung saan natin ito in-administer. Ngayon, ang limitation dyan sa age differentiation technique is hindi kasi lahat ng construct may kinalaman sa age. Merong mga psychological construct na walang connection, walang link ang age. But by the way, how would you know in the first place if a psychological construct is age-related? Yan ang kahalagahan kung bakit talaga dapat magbabasa ka ng review of literature. In fact, in test development, kung gagawa ka ng sarili mong test, this is step number one. Magbabasa ka ng maraming literature on the construct na gagawan mo ng isang test instrument. Dapat talaga marami kang alam doon sa construct na ginagawa mo para malaman mo kung yung construct ba na ginagawan mo ng test has something to do with age. Okay? So, yan lang yung limitation yan. Hindi lahat ng construct eh, age-related. In those cases, hindi mo siya pwedeng gamitin ng age differentiation technique. Halimbawa, yung mga construct ng uh, yung construct ng religiosity. 
yung construct ng stress, di ba? Wala namang masyadong link sa age yan eh. Di ba? Bata ka man, o matanda, o kahit ano man ng religion mo, lahat ng tao meron talagang stress. So in that case, if you are validating a test that measures stress, eh malabo mong gamitin yung age differentiation technique. Let's move on to case number two. Ready? Pause the video if you need to. This time, gumagawa tayo ng test that measures optimism. Gusto nating i-validate if this test is really measuring optimism. Pero ito yung mga givens no, in the situation. Number one, optimism has nothing to do with age. Nabasa natin sa literature. Optimism, number two, is strongly correlated with happiness. Again, how did we know? We read this from the literature. So, given these ideas about optimism, paano natin itetest kung yung dinevelop nating measure is really measuring optimism? Step one, hanap ka ng established test that is strongly related to your test construct. So, dito, hahanap ka ng isa pang test other than the test that you are developing. Pero yung test na dapat hahanapin mo shall be already established. Ibig sabihin ng established, reliable na, valid na, ginagamit na, nasa market na. That's what you mean by established test. Hanap ka ng isang psychological test na ganun, established. At yung construct niya, yung construct ng established test na yon must be strongly related to your construct. Halimbawa, happiness. Given the test that we are developing in this case, di ba, optimism, nabasa mo sa number 2, aba, correlated pa lang optimism sa happiness. So what do you do? Hanap ka ng established test on happiness. So by doing step number 1, there will be two tests on your possession. Possession number 1, yung dinevelop mong optimism test. Possession number 2, yung iyong established test on happiness. Step 2, hanap ka ngayon ng population where you will administer these two tests. Step 3, you administer the two tests. Again, ano yung dalawang tests na i-administer mo sa population na yan? Isang test on optimism, isang test on happiness. And then, you get the raw score, you note the scores for each individual, meaning sa isang tao, dalawa ang score niya. Yan ang magiging input niyan sa SPSS, dalawang columns. First score refers to the score coming from optimism scale, Second score coming from the test that measures happiness. And then, after you encode it that way, syempre, yung paborito natin, now we are going to correlate those two columns. Iko-correlate natin yung scores under optimism against scores under happiness. Step 5, yun nga, sinabi ko na, iko-correlate mo, and these are the possible outcomes. And the outcomes will determine kung yung test mo ba valid or hindi. Isa-isahin natin. Kapag yung correlation coefficient mo is positive and strong, what does that mean? If you correlated happiness with optimism and then positive and strong, valid yung test mo. Kasi nasunod yung sinabi sa literature. Highly related daw ang happiness and optimism and that's what you found out. The relationship is positive and strong. Pero, word of caution, Hindi naman dapat dito sobrang taas ng correlation. Halimbawa, positive 0.98. Hindi rin maganda yon kasi kapag positive 0.98 ang relationship between optimism and happiness, what does that say? Yung dinevelop mong score, or sorry, yung dinevelop mong instrument on optimism, eh walang pinagkaiba sa established test on happiness. So, baka yung dinevelop mong items, hindi nagme-measure ng happiness, rather, it is measuring, oh sorry, yung mga dinevelop mong items, baka hindi siya, hindi siya nagme-measure ng optimism, baka yung mga items na dinevelop mo, happiness ang mine-measure. Kaya sobrang taas ng relationship. So, I would say for number one, mas maganda dito moderate lang yung relationship. Positive and moderate relationship between happiness and optimism. Number two, if the correlation is negative and strong, then this is a, an indication, hindi valid yung test mo. Kasi hindi na naman niya sinusunod yung ine-expect natin coming from the literature. Sabi sa literature, positive ang connection between happiness and optimism, pero bakit yung direction dito negative? 
Ibig sabihin, yung test mo, hindi nagme-measure ng optimism, it is measuring something else. Number three, if the correlation is weak, the same conclusion. Sabi kasi sa literature, dapat moderately related ang happiness and optimism, but that's not what you saw. There is a weak relationship between the two which tells you na baka yung instrument na dinevelop mo, it's not measuring optimism after all. Pero, we are still under, uh, yun yung tinatawag natin, convergent validity, by the way, no? So, eto, yung lahat ng sinabi ko dito, ang tawag dyan, convergent validity. This is a procedure where we correlate the test to another established test with a related construct. Kinorelate natin yung optimism with happiness. Pwede mong i-correlate yung neuroticism with general anxiety. Again, we are correlating variables here or constructs here which are related, again, how would you know, according to the literature. Para malaman mo kung ano yung mga constructs na related doon sa construct ng dinedevelop mong test, magbabasa ka ng review of literature. Let me give you one example coming from a journal article, Moderation Effects of Perfectionism and Discrimination in Interpersonal Factors and Suicide Ideation. In one part of this journal article, specifically in the instruments part, pinakilala nila yung suicide ideation scale. So, dito, sa section na ito, meron silang nireport, no? Follow the, the yellow line. SIS, or the suicide ideation scale, were positively correlated with depressive symptoms and hopelessness scores. So, in this study, gumamit sila ng SIS. So, bakit kaya nila sinabi na yung SIS scores positively related with depressive symptoms and hopelessness? Kasi ito yung patunay na yung SIS na ginamit nila valid. So, bakit pa nila nire-report na yung scores ng SIS na ginamit nila ay positively correlated sa depressive symptoms and hopelessness? Kasi nabasa nila sa literature na yung suicide ideation ay connected, positively connected with depressive symptoms and hopelessness. Yun yung nire-report sa literature. Kaya nila pinagmamalaki yan. Kaya nila nilagay ito sa section na yan para ipakita sa readers na valid yung suicide ideation scale na yan. In other words, this suicide ideation scale is really measuring suicide ideation. Ebidensya, nung kinorelate namin ito, yung construct nito, sa depression at hopelessness, positively correlated as indicated in the review of literature. Meron pa silang isang test na ginamit, yung INQ-12, Interpersonal Needs Questionnaire. Again, look at this. Its construct validity has been supported by positive correlations with suicide ideation and depressive symptoms. Bakit na naman nila nare-report yan? Para patunayan sa mga readers that this questionnaire really indeed measures interpersonal needs. And according to the literature that they have read, Nung binasin nila yung literature on interpersonal needs, anong ibig sabihin nun? Nakita nila sa literature na yung interpersonal needs, again, according to the literature, very connected with suicide ideation and depressive symptoms. To make the long story short, yung INQ-12 in this study is a valid test. Okay, so yun yung tinatawag nating convergent validity. But before we leave convergent validity, there is another approach na may kinalaman sa convergent validity. Another alternative where we can do convergent validity is, ang gagawin, hahanap naman tayo ng established test na meron ng eksaktong o sobrang parehong construct. So going back to our case a while ago, we were developing a test on optimism. Kung gagamitin mo yung ganitong way of convergent validity, ang gagawin mo dyan, hahanap ka naman ng isa pang established test on optimism para i-validate yung test na ginagawa mo on optimism. Now, question, isn't that weird? Eh, kung meron na palang test sa market ng optimism, eh, bakit ka pa gumagawa ng instrument on optimism? Well, ang reason dyan, dito na papasok yung competition side of psychological test in the market. One reason why you would be developing a test with a construct na sikat na sikat na sa market, marami ng mga test na may ganong construct, 
Okay? The reason why you're going to do that is because, for example, you would like to have a competition against another test with the construct na dinedevelop mo. Parang ano lang, my, uh, iPhone, halimbawa. Diba? Bakit ba ginawa ang my phone? Kasi magkaiba sila ng market. Ang iPhone, mahal. Konti lang ang makaka-afford niyan. Siguro yung mga, yung mga nasa higher socioeconomic status lang. Pero yung my phone, ang target market niyan would be those people who are in the lower socioeconomic status. Diba? So, ginaya ng my phone yung iPhone. Pangalan pa lang, magkatugma na. Tsaka yung mga features almost the same. Touchscreen din, meron din mga widgets, so on and so forth. Diba? Kasi kinukompetensya ng my phone yung iPhone by targeting a different market. The same thing with psychological test. No? Halimbawa, going back to optimism, yung existing na test on optimism, mahal. At the same time, mahaba. Oh. Existing na siya, no? established na, sa, na siya. May reliability na, may validity na, binibenta na sa mar market, pero mahal at mahaba. So, gusto mo ngayon gumawa ng isa pang instrument, also in optimism, pero mas maikli at mas mura. If you succeed in developing such test, meron kang scale na nakakapag-measure ng optimism, plus mas maigsi na, mas mura pa, yung mga dating gumagamit ng optimism scale, na mahal at mahaba, eh, pupunta na sa'yo. ba? Diba? Yun yung dahilan kung bakit pa tayo gumagawa ng isang test na meron na palang ganong test sa market para magkaroon ng kompetensya, para magkaroon ng shorter version or cheaper version of an already existing test. Another example would be yung NeoPyR. NeoPyR is a very long test. So, gumawa yung ibang mga psychologists ng parang shorter version of the Neo PyR called the Neo FFI. So, yung Neo FFI, yun din naman ang sinusukat, the five components of personality. It's just that it's shorter compared to the traditional Neo PyR. Maliwanag. Okay. Now, let's continue our story here. What if your optimism scale does not have an age pattern? Hindi ka na pwede mag-age differentiation does not have an exactly equivalent test, hindi ka na pwede mag-convergent validity, and there's no construct related to it. Meron pa bang paraan para hanapin mo yung validity ng test na ito? Pwede pa. Gagamit tayo ng discriminant validity. Discriminant validity is the opposite of convergent validity where ang ginagawa natin dito, this time, we are correlating the construct of the test that we are developing with an unrelated construct. Sa convergent validity, highly related or exactly the same. Sa discriminant from the term itself, discriminate or different, gagamit tayo ng isang test na walang kinalaman sa test na dinedevelop natin. Para mas malinaw, let me give you the steps. Step 1, hanap tayo ng isang test na established na, pero this time, hindi siya related doon sa construct ng test na dinedevelop natin. Halimbawa, again, no, nagde-develop tayo ng scale on optimism. Ano kaya yung mga construct, psychological construct out there that has nothing to do with optimism? Pwedeng intelligence. Okay? Eh, sir, paano mo nalaman na walang kinalaman ng optimism sa intelligence? Magic word, review of literature. Usually, when you read the literature, sasabihin sa'yo, ano yung mga constructs related to that construct? Let's say optimism. So, lahat ng construct na hindi sinabi, wala sa listahan, then you can, you can use those constructs para gamitin for your discriminant validity procedure. Step 2. Dalawa na naman yung test na nasa kamay mo. Isang test on optimism, which you are developing, and another test on intelligence. Now, you administer those two tests to the same population. And then, alam nyo na naman ang input niyan kapag nilagay mo sa SPSS, column 1, their scores under optimism scale, column 2, their scores under the intelligence test. So, one person will have two scores, you correlate that. Mag-iiba ngayon ang storya niyan kapag gumagamit ka ng discriminant validity. This time, if the correlation is positive and strong, ang sagot dyan, hindi valid yung test mo. 
Kasi again, ang ini-expect natin sa discriminant validity, hindi dapat related. Different dapat yung dinedevelop kong test doon sa established test na kinuha ko. So, if your correlation coefficient is positive and strong, what does that tell you? Then, hindi nasunod yung expectation natin, we conclude that the test is invalid. However, in number two, if correlation is negative and strong, sa tingin nyo, valid or invalid ang sagot, invalid pa rin. Although, although negative ang relationship, pero strong pa rin eh. Yung magnitude strong. Again, ang ine-expect natin sa discriminant validity, hindi sila mag correlate because we are expecting that the construct of the test we are developing is different from the established test that we are using so dapat kung i-correlate mo yung dalawang yun hindi dapat sila correlated e sa situation number 2 they're correlated eh. negative nga lang yung direction but the magnitude is still strong magiging valid lang yung test mo kapag nakita mo sa correlation mo na mababa ang correlation coefficient which tells you that your test, the test that you are developing, is not the same or different from the construct of the test that you used. So, patunay yun na magkaiba nga. Magkaiba nga yung dinedevelop mong test kumpara doon sa established test na ginamit mo. It proves that they are different. Pero, ito ano, between convergent validity and discriminant validity, mas pinaprefer pa rin ng mga test developers ang i-establish yung validity ng test using convergent. It is more preferred. Why? Let, 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 me, just, um, let me just give you a short reason why convergent is more preferred. If you can follow the logic of convergent validity, especially if you use the second method, gamit ka ng isang psychological test, established psychological test, na ganun na ganun din ang construct sa test na dinidevelop mo. Okay? Kinorelate mo yung dalawa, tapos mataas ang relationship or moderate ang relationship. What does that prove? It proves that the test that you are developing is just as good as the established test that you used. Malakas na ebidensya yun na talagang yung construct ng test na dinedevelop mo ay pareho lamang doon sa construct ng established test na ginamit mo. Pero pag gagamit ka ng discriminant validity, kinorelate mo yung dalawang test at napatunayan mong they are different from each other. What does that prove? Ang napatunayan mo lang doon, yung test mo ay hindi kapareho doon sa established test na ginamit mo. Totoo yun, hindi sila pareho. Mababa ang correlation. Pero, does that prove that your test is really measuring what it claims to measure? No. What we know is that this test, ito na lang, this test is not this test. Clear? Pero, it doesn't say, it doesn't prove that your test is really measuring what it is supposed to measure. But convergent validity proves that. Kaya maraming mga test developer, no? Convergent validity ang kanilang prefer more than discriminant validity. Pero ito rin yung magandang tanong, no? What possible reason could there be kung bakit gagamit tayo ng discriminant validity as the first option? Usually, ginagawa yan kapag yung construct mo is something new. Meron kang naisip na bagong psychological construct and you want to prove to the psychological world that this construct is legitimately different from all the other psychological constructs. Wala siyang kapareho. It's a new discovery. It's the first of its kind. Then, maaaring gumamit ka ng discriminant validity. Halimbawa, bigyan ko kayo ng concrete example. Let's say you are doing research on personality. Tapos yung claim mo, merong bagong trait ang mga Pilipino na wala sa Big Five. Yung Big Five kasi, di ba, ocean. Oh. Gusto mo ngayon questionin yung ocean. Sabihin natin, cultural psychologist ka. Gusto mong patunayan sa psychological world na specific in the Filipino culture, meron tayong tinatawag na mema trait. Okay? Mema trait. Yung mema trait, ang claim mo, 
dapat isama sa Big Five. So, magiging Big Six na Ocean M. Lahat ng tao sa buong mundo, just like Filipinos, merong MEMA trip. Paano mo ngayon patutunayan sa mundo, sa psychological world, that there is such a thing as MEMA trait? Meron talagang construct ng MEMA trait. Ang pinakamatibay na ebidensya that you can have is to do a discriminant validity showing that when you correlate that MEMA trait to each of the five components, mababa ang correlation. Di ba? Mababa ang correlation ng MEMA trait sa O. Hindi connected ang MEMA trait sa C. Hindi siya connected sa E, hindi sa A, hindi sa N. What does that tell you? Aba, talagang distinct, different talaga ang MEMA trait compared to the five components of personality according to the Big Five Theory. Kapag naipakita mo yan sa data, then that is a strong evidence na mukhang kailangan na natin dagdagan yung Big Five, gagawin na nating Big Six. Yan yung isang use ng discriminant validity. Now, Question, what if I have no money to buy established tests to validate my test? Kasi yung convergent validity at yung discriminant validity, if you notice, you are going to use established test to validate the test that you are developing. Take note, kapag kukuha ka ng isang established test, hindi naman libre yun eh. Hindi mo lang naman ida-download yun eh. Bibilhin mo yun. Bibili ka ng mga established test for validation processes. Paano kung wala kang budget sa pagbili ng established test? Meron pa bang paraan para makapag-validate tayo without purchasing an established test? Ang sagot, meron. Dito na yun tayo gagamit ang tinatawag na contrasted groups method of validity. In this procedure, ang ginagawa natin, gumagamit tayo ng contrasting groups to validate a test construct. Magandang halimbawa, nagde-develop ka ng test that you claim to measure job stress. Kunin mo yung test na ito para malaman mo kung gaano ka ka-stress sa iyong trabaho. So, ano ang con construct dito? Job stress. Ngayon, ang gagawin mo sa contrasted groups, hindi ka hahanap ng established test that also measures job stress. Kasi wala kang ka pambili ng established test. So, what you do here is, hahanap ka na lang ng contrasting groups magkabaliktad na grupo in connection to job stress. Para mas malinaw, eh, bigyan ko kayo ng halimbawa. Humanap ka ng dalawang klaseng population. One population is working, sila yung may mga jobs, at humanap ka ng mga tao na non-working, yung, yung mga walang jobs, sabihin natin mga estudyante. So, two groups, the black and the yellow. What do you do? You administer the test that you are developing, the job stress scale. I-administer mo sa working people, i-administer mo sa mga students. Now, based on this procedure, ang logic dito, if my test is really measuring job stress, dapat mas mataas ang job stress ng mga working people compared to students. Because working people have jobs. Students don't. They just study. Yun nga lang, sisiguraduhin mo lang dapat na doon sa grupo mo sa students, walang working student. Kasi makokontaminate yung data. Make sure the students you're going to use here are full-time students. Di ba? So, given those contrasting groups, again, expectation, people who are working will have higher job stress compared to the students who are not working. Kapag napakita mo na ganun nga ang result, nag-t-test ka, significantly higher ang job stress ng mga working people compared to students, then you're able to prove that your test is measuring job stress. Pero oras na naging baliktad yan, masamang balita yan. Nakita mo halimbawa, mas mababa pa yung job stress ng mga working people compared to students, then what does that tell you? Your test is not valid. Maybe your test is measuring something else, but definitely not job stress. Or isa pang approach no? sa contrasting groups, in relation to job stress, mag-research ka. Ano ba yung mga jobs na stressful? Top 10 jobs that are stressful? Imagine ito yung mga nakita mo based on your research. Oh. Ang gagawin mo ngayon dyan, hahanap ka ng population working on that job that is very stressful. 
And then after that, hanap ka naman ng isang grupo pa na hindi ganun kataas yung stress sa trabahong yon. So let's say for example, in this list, piliin natin yung teachers. Kasi nakalagay dito, no? number 5 ang teacher, very stressful. No? So hanap tayo ng grupo ng mga teacher, hanap tayo ng mga grupo ng mga mascot. Kasi yung mga mascot wala sa listahan. Meaning, kung wala ka sa listahan na ito, malamang sa malamang, yung trabaho na yon mababa stress. Yung pagmamaskot. So, dalawang population na ngayon, yung titignan mo dito, yung mga teachers versus mga mascots, sino ang mas stressed using the job stress scale that you are measuring. So, i-administer mo naman na naman yung job stress scale na yan sa dalawang population. Again, what's our expectation? Dapat mas mataas ang level of stress ng mga teachers compared to sa mga mascot. Kapag napakita mo that the data is really like that, mas mataas nga ang job stress ng mga teachers compared to mascots, your test is valid. Pero kapag baliktad ang nakita mo, mababa ang mga stress ng mga teachers compared to the mascots, then your test may be not measuring job stress but something else. Now let's move on to the last method of construct identification procedures and let's start with a case. You read on your own silently, pause the video if you need to. In this case, meron tayong gustong malaman. No? Ang gusto nating malaman dito, yung itsura ng construct mo. In English, what your construct looks like. So, the construct that you are dealing, that you're dealing with here is math ability. And based on your research, on your review of literature, any test that really measures a person's math ability patches six different subskills. Subskill A, B, C, D, E, or F. Yun yung sabi sa literature. If you want to know how good you are in math, kailangan alam mo kung gaano ka kagaling doon sa anim na subskills na yan. Now, you, you are now developing a math ability test. Your construct is math ability. Tapos na yung mga items mo. Ang next mong problema ngayon is this. Ganyan ba yung itsura ng math test ability na ginawa mo? Tugma ba sa pagsasalarawan ng literature on what math ability looks like. In the literature, math ability looks like this. It measures six different subskills. The question now is, given all these items you have constructed, given all these items you have developed, ganyan ba ang magiging itsura ng test na ginawa mo? So how do we know that? No? Mamaya, pag-uusapan natin yan. Just a simpler analogy, baka kasi marami parang hindi makakuha dito. No? A very simple analogy, halimbawa, binibining Pilipinas. Imagine binibining Pilipinas is a psychological test. Ano kaya ang construct ng binibining Pilipinas? Beauty. Yan ang measure ng binibining Pilipinas. measure niya gaano kaganda yung mga tao na sumasali sa binibining Pilipinas. But the way binibining Pilipinas see beauty has three ways. Kung baga, using statistical term or using a psychometric term, there are three factors for you to say that somebody is beautiful. And what are those three factors? In Binibining Pilipinas standards, merong physical appeal, kaya merong swimsuit competition dyan, merong skill, kaya merong talent portion dyan, at meron din of course intelligence, kaya merong question and answer portion dyan. Those are the three factors of beauty that Binibining Pilipinas measures. Kaya sino ba ang nananalo sa Binibining Pilipinas? Yung kandidata na pinakamataas ang score in connection to those three factors of beauty. Maliwanag ba? So, ganun din ang gagawin natin in that case that we read. We want to know if the items we constructed that we claim to measure math ability, meron nga siyang six factors as indicated in the literature. Dito na ngayon papasok yung tinatawag nating factor analysis. It does two things. Number one, 
it is counting the number of dimensions or factor that the test has. And number two, it will also tell us which items are under each of those factors that our test has. Kung baga, if I am going to put this in a diagram, di ba, uh, titignan natin kung saang mga factors naglo-load, I'm using factor analytic terms here, saang factors naglo-load yung mga items in your test. Yan yung gusto nating malaman. Given those items that you develop, nakakabuo nga ba siya ng anim na factors? Sa anim na factors na yon, ano yung mga items na suma sa ilalim sa bawat isang anim na factors na yon? Those are the things that we want to know when we use factor analysis in validating the test. Now, let's talk about the steps. Step 1. Siyempre, kinakailangan, i-administer mo yung test, nung, yung test mo. Administer mo sa population. Now, after you administer the test, dito na ngayon madugo. Ang encoding yan sa SPSS or any software is, you need to really list down what your participants answered per item. Okay? So, alimbawa, si Pedro, ano ang sagot niya sa item 1? Si Juan, ano ang sagot niya sa item 1? Si Judas, ano ang sagot niya sa item 1? Kaya madugo talaga ang pag encode kapag gagamitan mo ng factor analysis. And then step 2, after you encode everything that you need to encode, you will run factor analysis using a software. This video is not intended to teach you how to run factor analysis using a statistical software. Hanap na lang kayo ng mga videos on that Pero ang goal ko dito is to let you understand the logic behind factor analysis. Paano ba nagde-decide ang factor analysis if the test is valid or not? Let me give you some hypothetical results that we can get when we run a factor analysis. It looks something like this. Definitely, makakakita ka ng maraming numbers. Diba? Usually, pag nagbasa ka ng journal article, nakakita ka ng maraming arrows na yan, maraming mga correlation coefficient dyan, e eh malamang sa malamang ginamitan yan ng factor analysis. Now, as we go along later on, you will understand bakit ganyan karaming number yung nakikita natin when a test undergoes a factor analysis. Let's first talk about this. How does factor analysis decide validity? Okay. Actually, this is a very important question. The main essence of factor analysis is it is simply correlating items to each other. Let me repeat that. Factor analysis is just using multiple processes of correlation wherein kinokorrelate niya yung item sa mga iba pang items in your psychological test. For example, nag-factor analysis ka ng isang test with 10 items, in-administer mo yung 10 items na yan sa 100 katao. Tapos in-encode mo yung bawat sagot ng isang tao sa bawat isang item. And then you run factor analysis. What will factor analysis do? Factor analysis will correlate items 1 and 2. Again, using the responses of participants in the process. Yun yung magiging basis niya. Iko-correlate niya gaano kalakas ang connection between item 1 and item 2. Diba? So, para makita niyo yung picture dyan. See? Subject 1, ang sagot niya sa item 1, 5. Subject 1, ang sagot niya sa item 2, 4. Subject 2, ang sagot niya sa item 1, 3. Subject 2, ang sagot niya sa item 2, 3, so on and so forth. You see the logic. Yan ngayon yung iko-correlate ng factor analysis. Ano ngayon ang correlation between item 1 and item 2. So, ang ending niyan, meron kang isang correlation coefficient between item 1 and item 2. Take note, this is only item 1 and item 2. Sa Tagalog, item 1 and 2 pa lang yan. Factor analysis, again, will correlate all the items in the test. Iko-correlate din niya yung item 1 and item 3, yung item 1 sa item 4, yung item 1 sa item 5, Lahat yan. 1, 6, 1, 7, 1, 8, 1, 9, 1, 10, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, so on and so forth. 
And guess what? This explains why we see this many correlation coefficients. Sana nakita nyo na yung reason. Kung bakit pag factor analysis, ang daming correlation coefficient na lumalabas, it has something to do with the logic of factor analysis. It correlates one item to the different items in the psychological test. But then, how does factor analysis decide kung ilang factors meron ng isang test based on that process? Balikan natin tong slide na to, no? Titignan lang ng factor analysis kung ano yung mga items na mukhang okay, malakas ang correlation sa isa't isa. So, this is a hypothetical example. The numbers with the same color are numbers with very good correlation with each other. So, that would be number 1 and 9, number 2 and 7, number 3 and 6, number 4 and 10, number 5 and 8. So, given this hypothetical result sa mata ng factor analysis, ang sasabihin niya ngayon, merong limang factors yung test na binavalidate natin. Lima. Okay? So, it, it already told us the first information about the test. How many factors are there? There are five. Yung pangalawa natin gustong malaman, Ano yung mga items under each of the factors? Sasabihin din ng factor analysis yan. Saan naglo-load yung mga items given the five factors? So that means items 1 and 9 is loading under factor 1. Items 2 and 7 under factor 2. 3 and 6 under factor 3. 4 and 10 under factor 4. And 5 and 8 under factor 5. See? Dalawang bagay na ang alam natin dito. Ilang factors meron sa test at ano yung mga items under each of the factors. Saan naglo-load yung mga items. So using factor analytic language, items 1 and 9 load under factor 1. But you know, this is an oversimplified um, explanation of factor analysis kasi posible rin in real life na yung isang item naglo-load sa multiple factors. Like for example, in this case, posible sa ibang results na yung 9 naglo-load din sa factor 2. Meron ding item 9 sa factor 3. That's also possible and that is not good. Kapag nakita mo as a test developer na yung item, isang item, naglo-load sa multiple items, that's a problematic item. It's either you delete that from the list or you revisit the item and then you modify. Para next time na iran mo ulit yung factor analysis, that item will just stay only in one factor. Diba? So madugo, madugong proseso itong factor analysis. You just study the specifics on your own. But generally, this is what factor analysis does. Let's go back to our case a while ago that we were trying to solve. Sabi sa Revlit mo, ang isang test that measures math ability meron siyang six dimensions or six factors. Now, fast forward. In-administer mo na yung test mo that claims to measure math ability and encode mo na yung kanilang mga responses per item, nag-factor analysis ka, pag lumabas sa factor analysis mo, six dimensions din. Then that proves that your test is valid. Your test is measuring math ability that touches six different subskills which is exactly what was indicated in the review of literature, your test is valid. Pero, papano kung halimbawa, sabi sa Revlit, ang isang math ability test, anim ang dimensions. Gumawa ko ng items, in-administer mo, nag-encode ka, nag ka ng factor analysis, bitin ang lumabas. Sabi sa analysis mo, tatlo lang ang dimension na nakikita ng software. Ibig sabihin, kulang ka pa ng tatlong dimension. Anong conclusion mo dito? Your test is only partially valid. Hindi naman totally invalid kasi nahit mo pa rin naman yung tatlo eh. Kaya lang kulang ka pa ng tatlo. But partially valid is not enough for you to release the test to the market and claim that it really measures math ability test. So anong gagawin mo dyan? I-review mo ulit yung items. Siguro mag-revise ka ng ibang items. Magdagdag ka ng mga bagong items. Reviewin mo ulit yung anim na dimensions based on the literature. 
siguraduhin mo na meron kang items na dinidevelop under each of those and then you administer again to a population and then you encode again and then you run factor analysis again and find out kung this time, six dimensions na. Ganyan katugo ang factor analysis. Pero ito, itong, itong situation na ito, yung kapag kinulang ka ng dimension compared to what's reported in the literature, meron din itong ano eh, cultural angle. Pwede mong i-argue dito, for example, na, ah, okay, sabi sa literature ang mat ability anim, pero sabi sa data ko, eh, tatlo lang dimension na lumabas. Now, you can argue something like this. Baka sa Filipino culture, yung konsepto natin ng mathematics, eh, tatlo lang talaga ang dimensions. Sa Western culture, anim ang dimensions. Pero, kung gagawa ka ng ganyang argument, eh, dapat matinding mga theoretical basis ang, ip ang ipapakita mo to prove, to really justify your claim that there are cultural differences in terms of math ability. Yung ibang kultura, merong six dimensions of math ability. Sa Pilipinas, tatlo lang. Oh. Dapat talaga patutunayan mo yan by using different theories to show that your claim is valid. Okay, so that's factor analysis. In summary, before we end this video, ito yung mga validity procedures na ginamit natin for, for today or pinag-aralan natin today. Ang pangalan ng category, Construct Identification Procedures. Kailan natin gagamitin to? Kapag gusto nating malaman if your test is really measuring the construct it is supposed to measure. Under this set of procedures, meron kang limang possible ways to answer that question. Is your test is is your test measuring the construct it is supposed to measure? You can use age differentiation, convergent validity, discriminant factor analysis or contrasted groups. Kahit isa lang yung gamitin mo diyan, hindi naman kinakailangan lahat yan gagamitin mo, no? So, you're developing a test. You want to show that your test measures what it is supposed to measure. All you need is to just use one method under construct identification procedures. Okay, so if you have any questions about any of the things I've told you in this short video on construct identification procedures, magtanong lang kayo sa comment section and I'm going to do my best to answer those questions. So, next time, Next video, pag-uusapan ulit natin, validity pa rin tayo. Part 2, we are going to discuss other ways to establish the validity of the test. Thank you for listening everyone. God bless.